Okay, hello. Um, so I wanted to, because I've already gotten uh, several questions about this, I wanted to say something about the first paper assignment first. Um, let's see, what's the best way to do this? Uh, Is that, no, that's not really readable, is it? Okay, that looks somewhat readable. Um, right, so, um, it's basically, it's a fairly simple assignment. Um, it's not really asking you to write a paper, um, making an argument for, you know, a thesis or something like that. Um, it's, uh, it's just about taking a short passage from Locke identify a short passage, either one of those listed below, or if you prefer another one of similar length, right? So there's a bunch of prompts that each, you know, one is a passage, but you can also choose another one if you don't like those, um, which can be interpreted in at least two different ways. Right, so this is important, and um, I think from experience and from the questions I've already gotten, it's not necessarily that easy to understand what this is about. So the point is um, like not to say, oh, Locke means this, and then, but I think something else, right? Or Locke means this, but he could have said this instead, or um, anything like that. It's, it's prior to all of that. It's about trying to understand what does Locke say? And that, you know, um, it's not always easy to tell. Um, or at least if you think about it, it's not as easy to tell, right? So what this is supposed to be an exercise in doing is like, um, this is the kind of thing you need to do over and over to read a text like this. You know, it, rather than read along and saying, oh yeah, Locke says this, Locke says that, Locke says the other thing, you have to be able to stop and say, wait, what, what did he say? Does it mean this or does he mean that? Right, so the idea is to take one of these passages or another passage and, where this, and like find a question about what actually does he mean by that? Now, I mean, it can be as precise as, um, as you know, getting down to the question of what, is, what does this word mean here, or what does this preposition go with, or, you know, does this and connect to all of this, or is it just these, you know, like, it can be really small things like that can be very important. Um... um or I think most of the hints I get I gave here looking as, as I look back at them, right? So each passage, oops, I can't scroll there. Scroll there, just scroll here. All right. All right, looking back, each of these passages, first of all, it says where it's from, in case you want to see the context or whatever, and then there's a hint. Um so I think most of the hints I gave point towards somewhat more amorphous type questions, not quite so detailed focused, although, um, but still the question of like, um, so if you take, for example, this second one where he's talking about innate ideas 
and saying that an objection to the to the possibility that the idea of it, identity is innate, pointing out that we don't agree about which things are identical and which are not, and that therefore we don't have a we don't have a clear, distinct, universal idea of identity. And then you know the hint is pointing in some direction, like. Um, Why is this an objection to the view that we have an, a, an innate idea of identity? What is the objection? Is it that, um, and obviously such an unclear idea wouldn't count as one idea, so it wouldn't be one innate idea of identity. So in other words, there couldn't be an unclear innate idea of identity because that doesn't make sense. Or is it pointing more towards um, yeah, there could be an unclear innate idea of identity, but it would be useless, so we wouldn't have that, right? Because our maker wouldn't give us a useless innate idea or something like this, right? So, I mean, those are two different ways of understanding the objection that the passage raises for someone who wants to claim there's an innate idea of identity. And it's just, and it's, I think it's not obvious which one Locke is saying. Now, and to do the assignment, you don't have to decide which one is right. But, um, in fact, you're not supposed to decide which one is right. <laughs> but what you do have to do is give some reason for each of them, right? Which could be a reason based on the content of the text. Well, it sounds more like he means this because he says blah, blah, blah. But remember, you're going to have to go back and give a reason for the other side, too. So the reason shouldn't be too conclusive. <laughs> yeah. But it sounds like he means this because, right, like in this case, you know, um, because he says that unclear ideas like this couldn't be the foundation. No, you're just supposed to select one passage. Yeah, sorry, someone just asked that. You're just supposed to select one. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a really long assignment if you had to do all of them. Um, yes, so um, um, you know, on that first sentence, it sounds like he kind of means that unclear ideas like that couldn't be used to to form principles from which we could deduce all our knowledge so they would be useless and that's why we wouldn't have them. You know, that would be one type of argument. But another type of argument might be that, like, you know, um, if he means this, it's going to cause him all kinds of problems because of so-and-so. So he must mean the other one. Right. And I mean, those two could go against each other. Like that's a simple way of, uh, that it often comes up. Like from the words, it sounds more like he means X, but X is really inconsistent with other things he's saying. Whereas Y doesn't fit the words quite as well, but it, you know, will help him avoid various problems. Right. I mean, that's just one way it can go. But do you understand basically what the nature of the assignment is? Are there questions about this? It's not easy, or at least not easy to do it well, but it's not super complicated. And it's just the same thing I do over and over again when I'm lecturing. <laughs> so, or one of the things I do. Um, I'm only asking you to do it once. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, okay, so if there are no questions about, oh, is the final paper a similar format? No, the final paper is much, is a, uh, is an actual paper, right? Like, it's supposed to have a thesis, and you're supposed to support it, and, you know, it's, it's supposed to be your thesis. Like, I have suggested topics, but they don't, by any means, narrow it down to a single question. So the, the final paper is quite different from this. The second paper, although the details are different, is similar to this in that it's kind of an exercise in interpretation. And how long does it have to be? Uh, I think it says here two to three pages. 
No, it doesn't say here. It says on the syllabus. I believe in the syllabus it says two to three pages. Um, you know, um, it's uh, if you feel that you have done a good job and it's only one and a half pages, then I wouldn't try to like stick in filler to make it be two pages. That's just basically a guideline to how much of a how big an assignment it's supposed to be. Um, and definitely don't make it a lot longer than that, if only because I don't want the TAs to have to deal with that. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, are there other questions about that? this back to Ooh, let me turn off that light that's causing all that glare. Hold on one second. There we go. That's it's still glare. That's from the window. I can't turn off the sun, so that's that's as good as it can get. All right. Um, okay. So um, as as usual, I'm hoping not to do this again today. But there's leftover business from last time, so let me get straight to it. Um, simple modes, right? So again. Uh, Fortunately, this stuff is left up from last time. I don't have to write it again. Remember that modes are a kind of complex idea. So all modes are complex ideas. But then modes are divided into simple modes and mixed modes. So simple modes are not simple ideas. They're formed out of simple ideas by the mind, just as, just as mixed modes are. But the difference is that in the case of simple modes, there's only one simple idea involved. Um, so how does that work? Well, um, so I think I read this last time, but I'm going to go back to it again. Um, uh, book 2, chapter 12, section 5, on page 160. Um, Yeah, okay, that's right. Of these modes, there are two starts which deserve distinct consideration. First, there are some which are only variations or different combinations of the same simple idea without the mixture of any other. So actually, you know, here's an example of the type of pro textual problem I'm talking about. Variations or different combinations of the same simple idea. What does that or mean? So, um, does it mean either or? So they're either variations of the same simple idea or different combinations of the same simple idea? Or is that what, in, uh, if you want to be fancy, is called an epexegetical or, <laughs> um, where the or just explains what you said before in different words, like variations, or in other words, different combinations of the same simple idea. 
So, um, um, in favor of that second reading is the examples he gives, which are the only examples he gives here. Um, right, as a dozen or score, score is 20, you see, I don't know that as a dozen or score, which are nothing but the ideas of so many distinct units added together. And these I call simple modes, right? So a dozen or a score are, you know, and this is still written up here too, right? They're like made from the unit repeated. So those are like different combinations of the same simple idea. Um, and, uh, I'm not going to go back to this text, but, uh, you know, when he talks about the operation of enlargement, um, where I don't think he says it's specifically about simple modes. Maybe I should go back to it, but I don't know. Anyway, um, but from the examples he gives there, he seems to be talking about simple modes again. Right. Oh, there's a question in the chat. I honestly took it as the last one since there was a comma in front of the or. Yeah, um, that... Um, um, the issue with that is that there are more commas in lock than we would put in. Right. I mean, they used to put in commas more than we do now. So if you pay attention, you'll see that many times there's a comma in a place where we wouldn't put a comma. Um, so um, um, with the way we put commas, yeah, it's still not clear. I mean, because the comma after idea is required by the without. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's it's okay. I just uh, no. It's I mean, it's a good point that like one of the things you have to be careful about here is that uh, you can't exactly trust Locke's punctuation to be exactly like ours. Um, um, anyway, so uh, I just realized I didn't switch back to this. Right. So, um, right. So like this, this is the idea of three, the way Locke thinks we make it. We put the unit together three times. That is, we put the idea of an unit together three times, as he would say, and we get the idea of three. So that's definitely a combination. And later on, when he talks about the idea of enlargement, remember his example, uh, he get, I think, gives the example of a dozen, and then he gives the example of the perches in a furlong. I looked this up again, actually. A perch is uh, five and a half yards, and there are 40 perches in a, in a furlong. So a furlong is pretty long. I guess that's what's called a furlong. Anyway, <laughs> uh, probably not. Actually, a furlong, I think, is actually... Oh, no, I'm getting confused with an acre, maybe. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, there are 40 perches in a, in a furlong. Again, that seems like we've combined the idea of furlong over and over again. Um... um However, on the other hand, the problem with that is if we try to understand all modes of space on that model, and this is what I was talking about at the end last time, so we try to understand all modes of space on this model of combination. Well, so what is the unit that we're adding together? You know, so if Locke thought that there were a minimum unit of space, then he might think that that's what we add together to get these modes of space. So this is like, you know, 
one space, so to speak, right? And if we want to get any mode of space, we add a bunch of these together. However, the problem is that, and as I also said, Barclay and Hume actually do think that our, idea, that our ideas of space are like that. But Locke doesn't, right? Locke says we don't have any idea of um, a smallest unit of space. So... Um, Therefore, it's tempting to say something else. Now, since I'm not doing the paper assignment, of course, I'm allowed to decide which one is right. <laughs> but notice, so far, I haven't said which one is right. I'm just giving reasons for each side, you know. So, you know, like, um, based on the examples he gives and perhaps the punctuation, although that's, like I said, is weak, but, you know, uh, it might seem like the... Uh, the one alternative that it's all combinations and variations is just another way of saying that. But on the other hand, it seems like because of the problem I just said, it would be nice to say, well, no, in the case of space, the simple idea that we're adding, or sorry, the simple idea that we're forming modes of, we're not forming modes of it by adding it to itself. We're forming modes of it, at least to begin with, by limiting it. So at this point, I can't really draw a picture of this. But I guess I'll just say, what is the simple idea of space? Um, and if you pay attention to what Locke says about it, he doesn't say it's the idea of the smallest space. He just says space itself is a simple idea. The simple idea of space is the idea of space in general. Um, so how can we make that work? Well, in that case, if someone asks, like, how do we get the idea of... Okay, so we got the idea of a furlong by adding together perches, and we got the idea of a perch by adding together yards. How did we get the idea of a yard? Doesn't it have to stop somewhere? The answer could be, well, we got the idea of a yard not by forming a combination, but by forming a variation of the idea of space. Um... So, in, in favor of this, if you look at the beginning of Book 2, Chapter 13, which is um, about the simple modes of space, um, Book 2, Chapter 13, Section 2, um, This is confusing me. Men perceive by their sight a distance. I haven't talked about the issue yet in this course about him saying men, I don't think, and using gender exclusive pronouns. Um, I talked about it some in one, it comes up in every course basically, uh, at least for reading philosophers that were originally written in English, it always comes up. Um, um, I don't, there isn't, there isn't something really simple to say about it. I mean, on the one hand, of course, usually when he says men, he doesn't intend to exclude women. Um, although the possibility is always there and sometimes there's a passage we're going to get to later that I call attention to where he seems to um, 
play a kind of rhetorical trick where he suddenly takes advantage of the fact that it could mean men and not women, and it's not necessarily a synonym for human being. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, people who were in 144, one of my other courses will have to bear this story again, but, um, you know, uh, it, not that they don't have problems with this in other languages, but I think we have a special problem with it in English, maybe also in French. Um, you know, there's this thing in the Lord of the Rings where the, like the Lord of the Nazgul, no man will destroy him. There's a prophecy, no man will destroy him. And uh, in the end, he ends up being killed by a woman and a hobbit. <laughs> but um, <laughs> leaving the hobbit aside, he ends up being killed by a woman. And that's so it's like a riddle, basically, right? Like no man will destroy him. So how could he be destroyed? Because at that point, you're thinking man is means human being right but then when you find out what happens you're like oh it meant man rather than woman so i knew someone who uh was a fan of tolkien but his english was not that great and he'd only ever read it in hebrew translation and he didn't get the riddle like maybe there would have been a way i, I don't think but anyway uh, they basically, I mean, I don't think there was a way. They basically were forced to translate, no man will destroy him, either in a way that made it clear that it could be a woman or in a way that made it clear that it had to be a man, right? So, the, so like, the he didn't get the, he had some other explanation for why the prophecy was fulfilled that he, that he worked out, right? So, um, so what I'm saying is, like, this word in English you know, for a long, long time has been double-edged. Um, that's like the particular problem we, we have with it. Um, so therefore, when you're reading people like this, you can't just kind of correct them, like he should have said human being, because sometimes they're actually, as in that Tolkien example, they're actually using that ambiguity for something. And yet, of course, on the other hand, that ambiguity is not good, <laughs> right? I mean, that is the fact that the main word you use for human beings could mean only men and not women is obviously not just a like interesting linguistic fact. It's a, uh, right? I mean, it's, it's an aspect of oppression. So it's difficult to know how to deal with this. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to apologize it for, for it every time he says it, although I will call attention to places where it raises an issue in particular. Um, all right. Um, so in other words, I guess I'm saying like, it really is part of the history of philosophy and speech in general in English. And, you know, like we can't make it go away. Um, you could use it as an argument not to read the history of philosophy. By the way, you know, women also wrote this one, right? I mean, it wouldn't help to, to only read uh, women who wrote philosophy in the 17th century. They also sometimes do something interesting with it. Um, and sometimes the point is, you know, like the kind of point that you might expect. Like you were thinking that, you were thinking that human beings were all men, weren't you? <laughs> bang, you know, suddenly you notice. But in any case, um, so that's that's all I have to say about that at the moment. Um, all right, so getting back to this, men perceive by their sight a distance, right? Like in this case, obviously he doesn't mean, but women perceive it some other way. He's just, you know, in this case, it doesn't strike him as a problem that he's talking about all human beings using the word men. And if you asked him, before you asked him, it's not so clear. He's probably imagining men, not women, right? But if you asked him, oh, do you mean men and not women? I'm sure he would say, no, no, of course, man just means human being here, right? Um, so anyway, men perceive by their sight a distance between bodies of different colors, right? So um, that is, what do we perceive um, we perceive a distance. 
that's how we get ideas of finite modes of space. So, like, here's one body, and here's another body. Now, there might be that we don't see or feel anything in between, or in any case, we're not paying attention to what's in between. So there might as well be nothing there. And we perceive what? Well, um, there's nothing here, so we don't perceive this. Um, and be also because, right, that is this can't affect our senses. There's nothing there. Bodies, as we know, can affect each other by solidity. If there's no body there, or no body that we're taking into consideration, then there's nothing there that can affect our senses. So we don't sense this. We perceive by our sense a distance. So that is, we perceive these two bodies as limiting space, I think, is the way to look at this. And meanwhile, because there's nothing here, it also doesn't have any parts. Now, um, that may seem like a strange thing to say, but um, here's Locke, I think, saying it on in Book 2, Chapter 13, Section 13, at the bottom of page 166. Um. To divide and separate actually is, as I think, by removing the parts one from another, to make two superficies, that is, surfaces, where before there was a continuity. Right? So in this case, we're talking about dividing, actually dividing a body into two pieces. How do you do it? Well, you make there be two surfaces where before there was no surface but just continuous body. That's the division, right? So like we had a continuous body. There's no surface in here, no actual surface. Can't see your board. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Here's the continuous body. I, I tend to draw everything at a slant because I stand over here. Here's the continuous body. There's no surface in it. Then I cause to move in such a way that now there's two surfaces. That's division. That's actual division. And then he says, um, and to divide mentally is to make in the mind two superficies where before there was a continuity. Right? So if I don't actually divide the body, but just think of it as divided, what I'm doing is imagining the parts moving apart such that there's two surfaces. Right? And consider them as removed from one another. Um, which can only be done in things considered by the mind as capable of being separated. So in order to divide it mentally into pieces, I have to think of it as possibly actually divided into pieces and by separation of acquiring distinct superficies, which they then have not, but are capable of, right? So in order to, to, to mentally divide something into pieces, I have to consider its possibility of moving apart from itself in such a way that there's now two surfaces where before there was continuity. So I can only mentally divide something into pieces if... I think it could actually be divided into pieces. But neither of these ways of separation, whether real or mental, is, as I think, compatible to pure space. Right? So what he's saying is, if there's no body here, 
then sure enough, there are no surfaces, but there's also nothing I can do to make there be surfaces. <laughs> there's many, let me draw like dots around it so you can see what I'm talking about. There's nothing here. So there's no way to move it so that there'll be surfaces. Or to put it differently, space is always continuous and there's no way of breaking the continuity. Therefore, it can't actually be separated, right? So in other words, and I think this part is pretty normal to say, <laughs> right? If I just have empty space in a box, I can't take part of the empty space away from the other empty space. Um, but he's saying, therefore, I can't divide it mentally either. It doesn't have parts, it's simple. So whenever there's nothing there, it's the same simple idea of space. Only variations are made in it by the way it's limited by bodies. I think that's what he's saying. Okay, um, I could say a lot more about that, but um, but I don't want to because I want to go on to other stuff. But are there questions? What I'm saying about Locke's theory of space, in particular, like what the simple idea of space is and what the modes of space are. So the simple idea of space is not the idea of a really small space. In fact, you could say the simple idea of space is the idea of infinite space, space not yet limited. But what I'm about to go on to talk about is, is what Locke actually says about infinity. He doesn't call that simple idea of space without any limits infinite space, but maybe he should. Um, in which case he would he would end up saying that we do have an idea of an actual infinite space. Um, but anyway, that's not the way he thinks of it. He thinks of it as just, um, I guess you could say, space that's not yet finite, indefinite space. That's the simple idea. And every one of the modes is a kind of limitation of that simple idea. Um, or at least that's how we first get ideas of modes. Then, as he says, once we have the idea of any unit, which is always, the unit itself is never the simple idea of space. It's always already a mode, of, a simple mode of space. Once we have something we can use as a unit, then we can use this operation of enlargement to get other ones. But it doesn't start that way. It starts with limitation, not with combination or addition. Okay. If there are no com questions about that, I'm going to go on to infinity. On to infinity. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is still the reading from last time, so I'm trying to get through it quickly. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of weird things about Locke's theory of the infinite, and there's a lot of things I could talk about, um, but I just want to call attention to a couple things about it, and they're both um, aimed against Descartes. So that's why they're especially interesting. Um, so the first thing... Um, is Locke's claim that infinite applies primarily to quantity. Now, I mean, this may seem kind of obvious to us. Like, well, maybe I should read where he says this. Um, this is uh, book two, chapter 17, section one on page 199. 
Um, finite and infinite seem to be seem to me to be looked upon by the mind as the modes of quantity, and to be attributed primarily in their first designation only to those things which have parts and are capable of increase or diminution by addition or subtraction of any the least part. And such are the ideas of space, duration, and number. Okay, so, um, right, when he says primarily or in its first designation, he's, you know, he's alluding to a somewhat technical theory of, like, the meanings of equivocal terms that, um, um, besides, uh, besides cases where a word means the same thing every time and cases where a word means two completely different things, like, you know, like when you, when you call the edge of the river a bank and when you call, like, I would say a place where you keep your money, but I don't know if that's really what banks do now, but whatever it is banks do, <laughs> a bank, <laughs> Um, so, uh, I guess, I mean, you do keep your money there. Let's say that. Right. So, um, like you call those two things a bank, you're using bank in totally different senses, but in between is a use where the word has a primary use and then it has other uses which are derived from the primary use. So like Aristotle's example is health where, or healthy, right, where like the primary sense is when we say that an animal, a human being or other animal is healthy. But then you could also call it food healthy, you could call medicine healthy, um, you could call a urine sample healthy, right? So in that case, healthy doesn't mean the same thing, right? Like when you call the urine sample healthy, you don't mean that it's doing really well, <laughs> and that's not sick. You mean that it's a sign that the animal it took is taken from is healthy. So, uh, oh yeah, financial institution, that's a good suggestion. Um, although it's not quite as pithy as where you keep your money. Anyway, um, so, uh, right, so Locke is saying similarly about infinite. He's saying that the primary use of infinite is for quantity. Then when we call other things infinite, like power, for example, is one of his main examples. When we say something is infinitely, or when we, when we talk about the idea of something infinitely powerful, it's like by relation somehow to quantity. So like we're calling it infinitely powerful because it has the power to make infinitely many things move at the same time or something like that. Right, so what's really infinite in the strict sense is the quantity and then in a secondary sense we call the power infinite. Right, or similarly we talked about infinite wisdom. You, it might be like um, involve knowing an infinite quantity of things or knowing them infinitely well or something like that. Well, now that's infinitely well is already, but being able to derive infinitely many consequences from them or, you know, something like that. Um, um, so I think, I mean, I think that sounds pretty... I think to us that sounds pretty uh, straightforward, like that is the way we tend to think of infinite. Like it's basically something that goes with number, size, time, um, but, uh, but it's a direct challenge to the way Descartes talks about the infinite in the third meditation. So it's a challenge to Descartes' proof of the existence of God in the third meditation. Now, I mean, not because Locke uh, is critical of proofs of existence of God in general. He has his own proof, which we'll see later, but his proof may not prove exactly the same thing exists as Descartes does. So that's um, one reason he might want to criticize Descartes' proof, other than just the fact that he doesn't think it works or something. It might be a motivation to criticize it. But anyway, you know, like De Descartes' proof works with the thought that the um, God is, my idea of God is the idea of an infinite substance, 
And again, this is the third meditation proof, not the fifth meditation proof, which is the the fifth meditation proof is the um, so-called ontological argument. But the third meditation proof works with the fact that my idea of God is the idea of an infinite substance. And um, this idea is the idea of something... Um, so great that I couldn't have brought the idea about by myself is somehow or other how the proof is supposed to work. So, but Locke is not getting into those later details, the somehow or other part. He's saying to begin with that um, the kind of idea of infinite substance that Descartes says we have, we don't have at all. What we have, strictly speaking, is the idea of infinite number or infinite space, but of course that's not what Descartes says, means when he says our idea of God is an idea of an infinite substance. It doesn't mean that God is infinitely big, or there's infinitely many of him. On the contrary, he thinks, you know, and this is perfectly traditional, that God is absolutely simple. <laughs> So um, there's, a, there's only one in some really strong sense. <laughs> um, so if this is our primary uh, idea of infinity, then what uh, Descartes is calling our idea of God is not actually an idea that we have. Um, and that's one reason why Locke, as soon as he says this, the next thing he goes on to do is to discuss our idea of the inf of the infinity of the divine attributes and says you know i don't doubt there's something incomprehensible in god but when we call him infinite um we're relating it somehow to quantity because that's all that's the only way we can understand infinity um right whereas what does descartes mean by it or what does he intend to mean by it and what do traditional metaphysicians mean by this when they say, like Aristotelians, not Aristotle himself in this case, but Aristotelians, um, they mean um, um, outside of any definition, something like that. Right? You know, the definition has the same, has that same finite. Um, right. So they mean beyond any definition, beyond any concept. Um, Descartes is, I mean, Locke is saying we don't have an idea like that. Um, and the second challenge gets to more to the details of Descartes' proof where at least as the way Descartes, in between, there's a lot of weird, complicated metaphysical stuff. But at the end of the third meditation, Descartes sums it up by saying that um, what it comes down to is this. I have the idea of myself as something finite, um, but um, I can't have that idea except as um, a negation of the idea of the infinite. So I can't, and then somehow that's connected to the thought that I can't understand myself except as a, as a dependent being. I can't understand anything finite except as a dependent being. And it, then since there can't be all dependent beings without something they depend on, that's roughly speaking how the proof works. If, if you come back in 100B, I'll try to say it better. <laughs> um, but, um, but in any case, again, not getting into that later part, which is what you might think is the more questionable parts of the proof, Locke is cutting it off at the beginning by saying, we don't get our idea of the finite by negation of the infinite. So we don't have an idea of the infinite that comes before any idea of anything finite. That's what Descartes is saying, right? Descartes is saying, how could we so much as understand the concept of limitation if we didn't first have the concept of the unlimited, which is then limited?
And I mean, quite apart from its use in the proof of the existence of God, this would be bad news for Locke if it were true, because where we couldn't have got that idea of the infinite from experience. We never experience anything infinite. So it would have to be innate. And indeed, Descartes says it's innate. Right, Descartes says that the idea of the infinite is like the stamp of my maker in me. Um, then he also says there's no need that the stamp be different from the object made. That, in other words, maybe like my whole existence is, as, insofar as I know it, is that limitation that is the stamp of the maker in me. But in any case, sorry, I'm getting, I keep getting tempted to talk more about Descartes. Back to Locke, <laughs> right? Locke is saying that um, Locke has to explain how we can get the idea of the infinite such as we have it from experience. Now he could say we have no idea of the infinite at all. I don't, I think he doesn't want to say that in part because it would like destroy mathematics, right? Like if I say, you know, these lines produced to infinity will never meet. Um, uh, I seemingly understand what that means. If I don't understand what it means, it means I don't understand uh, the a theorem of geometry. It's, I mean, of course, well, I shouldn't say of course, but anyway, this is a this is a theorem of Euclid's geometry, right? That is, if there's two lines and a third one cuts both of them and makes a right angle with both, then produced to infinity, they'll never meet. So, um, so Locke wants to say, we do have an idea of the infinite. It's not innate, and it doesn't come before the idea of the finite. Rather, we get the idea of the finite first. So, um, going back to the beginning of chapter 17, um, the same passage I was reading before, but of course I didn't leave it open. Um, where is this? Well, it's not exactly the same passage. It's in section two. Book two, chapter... Uh, right here, as you can see, the part where he's mentioning the divine attributes. That's where he's thinking about Descartes. Okay, but now, underneath, Book 2, Chapter 17, Section 2. Um, as for the idea of finite, there is no great difficulty. The obvious portions of extension that affect our senses carry with them into the mind the idea of finite. So, again, I think... Um, what he means, I erased it, unfortunately, but what he means is that, you know, every time we consider the distance between two surfaces, whether there's a body in there or whether there's not, but there's bodies here, we get the idea of a, of a finite distance. That's how we get the idea of a finite distance. So nothing's easier than to get the idea of a finite distance by the senses. This, by the way, is also why when I was discussing ideas that go with every idea, and I mentioned existence and unity, these are the ones that Locke mentioned explicitly, and then he mentioned that we might want to add power because every idea is the idea of the power to cause us to perceive that idea, every simple idea. And maybe other. And I and I also mentioned that we might want to add limit, right? Since whatever we perceive is always finite, this idea of limit, which I think Locke says somewhere is doesn't say it here, but is a simple idea itself. This idea of limit comes in 
with every idea. Okay, but anyway, be that as it may, uh, it's therefore it's not hard at all to get the idea of finitude from experience. But then Locke has to explain how do we get the idea of the infinite, and um, there's a lot of weird things about the way the solution goes, which, as I said, I'm not going to get into. But the basic answer is that our idea of the infinite is the idea of always more than any finite amount that you propose, so to speak. Right? So like in this case, when I said produce these lines to infinity, they'll never meet. It means that like um, no matter how far you tell me to go, it will uh, they always will not yet have met. So he calls it a growing idea. <laughs> um, uh, right? Similarly, if you say, you know, um, um, God has existed infinitely in the past, eternally. According to Locke, you mean specify any finite distance back into the past, and I'll say that God already existed before it started. So in that sense, we have an idea of infinity, but we don't have an idea of the infinite finished, like an, an actual infinite quantity. Here's all the time taken together. Um... Right? I mean, that's the kind of idea of infinite that Descartes says is innate. We start off with an idea of limitlessness as something complete. And then we supply negations to it to form the idea of the finite. But Locke says the only we don't have that kind of idea of infinity. The only kind of inf idea of infinity we have is the one that starts with finite things. And that by adding together finite things, of course, you always only get another finite thing. But the idea of the infinite is you could always add another and whatever will still be true. On the simplest level, just you can always add another and there'll still be room for another. Right? That's the infinity of the number series. So he says, you know, if someone claims they're thinking of an infinite number, as opposed to the infinity of the numbers, if someone says, I'm thinking of an infinite number, ask them, can you add one to it? And if they say no, then they're not thinking of a number at all. And if they say yes, then they're not thinking of an infinite number because you could add something to it. Um, now, um, we now, you know, for those who are interested in this kind of stuff, uh, you might ask, like, what about Cantor's theory of transfinite cardinal numbers? And, you know, um, the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, like, whether that's, I guess, when I say it's complicated, if you're to ask, so does that refute Locke? Does that show he's wrong, that he was wrong and we do have an idea of infinite numbers? Cantor thought so, but, um, but after everything that's happened with the foundations of set theory since then, it's really unclear exactly whether that's whether this shows that Locke was wrong or not. But in any case, that's the way Locke thinks about it. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about the infinite. Um, again, there's a lot of weird things about the way Locke talks about it, but I'm not going to get into them unless someone asks about them. Are there any questions anyone has about this or about anything else about Locke's theory of the infinite? You know, you're... You're more than welcome if you're actually doing the reading on that assumption to, if I don't talk about something, to say, hey, what about what he said here? Can you explain that? <laughs> it's always possible. I don't know if that's ever happened. <laughs> anyway, that, that happens in office hours, I guess. Maybe that's a better time for it. I don't know. All right. 
All right, if there's no questions about this, I'm going to go on to talk about relation. Um, so I think, as I said, when I, when I gave a kind of, uh, when I drew that tree of all of Locke's, um, types of ideas in general, Um, I think you could draw something here, you could write something here like absolute or positive. And then this would be divided into modes and ideas of substances. And then this, of course, is divided into simple and complex modes, but I won't write that again. And then here, on the other hand, we have relative. In other words, I think um, uh, in some sense, like all the complex ideas we've discussed, all the other complex ideas that Locke discusses all go together and are all opposed to this other kind of complex idea, which is called relative. And just in terms of terminology, so, like, the regular opposite of relative is absolute. Um, um, that's, so, like, if you're, if, if you're ever, like, really having trouble understanding what someone, some philosopher is saying, because they keep talking about absolute, like Hegel, for example, to pick a random example, then uh, not that this will solve your problem, but at least a step in the right direction to remember that absolute is supposed to be the opposite of relative. Um, um, right? I think now we often use it just kind of generically to intensify what we're saying, right? Like, you know, do you think the price of potatoes will go up next year? Absolutely, <laughs> right? Meaning what? I'm absolutely certain as opposed to relatively certain, right? So absolutely certain is a sense of certain in which you're either certain or you're not. Whereas relatively certain is like more certain than some, some other degree of certainty, so it's relative. Right, so that's how the words relative and absolute are at least supposed to function. Um, but Locke very often um, uses, sometimes he says absolute, but I think officially the word he uses as the opposite of relative is positive, um, which has something to be said for it, except it's confusing because it's also the opposite of negative. Does he think that negative ideas as such are always absolute, are always relative? He doesn't say that when he talks about them. I think these are just two different uses of positive. So anyway, and it's especially confusing because, of course, we constantly use positive as the opposite of negative, but positive as the opposite of relative is not something... I'm sure Locke isn't the only one who does this. In fact, I've probably seen it in like medieval philosophers or whatever and forgot all about it. I'm sure he didn't invent it, but it's not very usual, <laughs> right? So you have to keep that in mind. Okay, so anyway, um, and the first place it turns up is um, at the beginning of the chapter on relation, book two, chapter 25. Um... Section 1, page 2, wait, section 1, page 288. Oh, sorry, I was thinking about that. 
you know, the very beginning of the chapter, besides the ideas, whether simple or complex, oh, that's not what I wanted to read. This is what I wanted to read. And the denominations given to positive things, intimating that respect and serving as marks to lead the thoughts beyond the subject itself denominated to something distinct from it are what we call relatives. And the things so brought together related. Right, so the denominations given to positive things, intimating some respect and carrying us beyond the subject of denomination. Right, so like, here's a, here's a thing. <laughs> a positive thing, meaning like, I don't know how to define this except by saying it's not relative. <laughs> I mean, it's just something we have an idea of, but now I denominate it by, let's say I call it bigger, right? So I denominate this thing bigger. What am I, one question you guys, what am I, what's the, I ask, you know, when I was talking about nominalism, I pointed out the denomination means that you're calling, giving something an attribute based on some name, right? Like bigger than this would be the nomen here that we're denominating it from. But, but like leaving that aside, just think, you know, we're calling it bigger. By calling it bigger, we're intimating some respect that carries us beyond the subject of the denomination. The subject of the denomination, the thing that is bigger, is this thing. But in calling it bigger, we're intimating a respect that carries it beyond itself to something else. The something else is something smaller, obviously. Right, so the relative predicate bigger applies to this positive thing, but it applies to it only insofar as we consider it with respect to something else. Um, And this is based on, so like, how is it that we're able to form ideas like this? So, I mean, this is not a simple idea. Well, of course, big itself is not a simple idea. Um, Locke talks about wider. I'm not sure I agree that is there such a thing as, I guess it depends how you think of brightness. The close to saturation. Well, anyway, um, but there's definitely such a thing as like warmer. Now, warmth or heat is probably uh, something Locke would say is a simple idea. So the idea of warmer is not a simple idea. Um, it takes that simple idea of warm and combines it with another idea, which is the idea of respect to something else that doesn't have as much of it in this case. Um, so, oh, okay, this is a question here. Is this ultimately just saying that comparatives are used in relation to something else? If so, that's a fa fancy way to go about it. Well, I mean, um, It's, uh, it's, a way to, uh, it's a way to go about it that sh that's supposed to show what Locke thinks the fundamental pieces, steps that are needed to get this done are, right? I mean, like, um, 
that we have to refer to one thing, but at the same time somehow carry our thought beyond itself to something else. So, I mean, it is just a way of saying that, but it's a way of saying that that carries a that calls attention to exactly what is special, maybe strange about it. Um, but also, as you'll see in a moment, it 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 limits what Locke can be thinking of. This way of thinking of relation limits what Locke can consider to be relations. So I'll get back to that in a second. But first, I want to say, so how is it that we're able to, to form a complex idea like Warmer? And Locke says, well, it's because of this mental operation um, of, I guess this is the operation of comparison. Um, and now it is at the very beginning of the chapter. Besides the ideas, whether simple or complex, that the mind has of things as they are in themselves. So as they are in themselves means here, of course, not the way at least some people think Kant means like behind the appearances or something like that. It just means as they are considered in themselves as opposed to considered outside themselves. And you might think, well, of course, they, how can they be considered outside themselves? But that's exactly what we're talking about here. There are others. It gets from their comparison one with another. The understanding and the consideration of anything is not confined to that precise object. It can carry any idea, as it were, beyond itself, or at least look beyond it, to see how it stands in conformity to another, to any other. Yeah, he seems to be a little bit unsure exactly how this works. Is it that we can carry the idea beyond itself, or is it that we can focus on the idea, look at the idea, so to speak, but at the same time look beyond it? look through it outside of it. I, I don't know if that's just a difference in a metaphor or if that actually might make some difference to the theory, which of those you say. It seems like he thinks they're different because, see, you know, like notice what I'm doing to the text here. <laughs> I'm doing it <laughs> every time I look at a sentence, I'm doing this over and over again. Even if I read the sentence a million times before, I'm still having these thoughts. Like, because he says at least, if these were just two metaphors for the same thing, as it can, as it were, do this, or in other words, as it were, do this, right? But to say at least makes it sound like maybe it can't go as far as to do this. Maybe it can only do something smaller, right? So that makes it seem like the two metaphors are not supposed to be equivalent. Okay, I don't have anything any farther to go with that for now, but I just, you know... I'm pointing that out. All right. So in any case, um, um, you know, and when you're reading, like a lot of times you don't have anywhere farther to go with it. You just notice, oh, okay. Sounds like there's, there's two different things here. I'm not sure what the difference is supposed to be. You know, and you might never find out anything to do with that. But and if you do, you might forget it. But <laughs> when the time comes, but at least if you keep noticing things like that, you're you know like on the path towards possibly getting farther into understanding the text. Um, okay, so right. So anyway, so the way it's because we have this mental operation we can carry out. You know, like. Here's the mind. Again, the first operation is perception. This thing affects me, you know, makes me perceive the simple idea of warmth. But now, and I guess, you know, I also perceive this thing, which now is not smaller, but colder. I'm using warmth, which made me perceive that, made me perceive the idea of less warmth. Right? But now I have a further operation of comparison, which allows me to call back this idea in memory, I guess, or retain it in contemplation, but also look beyond it. Yeah, I should draw these two ideas differently. I think one of them bigger than the other. Look beyond it to this one. Right, so this is the operation of comparison. 
And this is active, right? So like all um, complex ideas, I can form this voluntarily, according to Locke. Um, it's something I do, or at least can do to my ideas. Um, maybe sometimes the comparison is forced on me, but it doesn't have to be. I can do it myself. Um, so, and, um, and this is or leads to perceiving or noting the idea of a relation. In this case, the relation of warmth. I guess you say this is the idea of one. Or maybe, or this comparison forms the idea of one. I'm not sure which is the way that it's it. Um, okay. Uh, oh no, so there's a question here in the chat. Would the absolutes be ideas like hot and cold and the relative what is between? Right, yes. So, um, so simple ideas are all absolute ideas. I mean, that's just the other face of the coin of what I was saying, that a relative idea is always a complex idea. It always involves at least the idea of the thing that's being compared and the idea or, or the looking beyond it to another idea. Um, so every simple idea is absolute, but many complex ideas are also absolute. Right? So like the idea snowball. Yeah, I mean, there's something, uh, you know, and Locke talks about this when he talks about the idea of power. Are any of the ideas really absolutely absolute? <laughs> right? Like the idea of a snowball includes the idea of whiteness that is... So I'm attributing to the snowball the power to make me perceive whiteness. So I'm attributing to the snowball a kind of relation to me. So there is something relative about it. Um, but, uh, but obviously we're not counting that kind of something relative about it when we make this distinction between absolute and relative ideas. So, right, so say the snowball, Ray, a snowball is a snowball considered in itself, not by relation to something else. Um, I guess another way of casting doubt on that might be to say, well, a snowball, a sphere that sort of naturally forms out of snow isn't a snowball. A snowball is an artificial object. So it contains a relation to the person who made it or something like that. I, I, you know, it's relative. It's just, well, does that really make it relative? Maybe not. It doesn't matter who or what made it. It's just the fact that it's, it's made. Yeah, I don't know. Let me, I'm just getting myself confused here and therefore getting you even more confused. Let me go back and say the simple thing that you would think about the snowball. The snowball is a snowball. It's not like a snowball compared to something or related to something. It's just a snowball. So that kind of complex idea is um, absolute. Whereas, for example, you know, uh, so one of Locke's examples is the idea of king. So when you call someone a king, of course, it's not obviously relative the way warmer is. Right? Warmer, you know, or causes part of the relations, is what Garrett asked. Well, I mean, When you denominate something by its cause, then that's a relative predicate. So it's a relative idea, right? So, like, for example, if I call it an effect, <laughs> it's only an effect relative to a cause. Um, so that's why I was thinking maybe also calling something a snowball is naming it relative to its cause in the sense that it can't be a snowball unless it has the proper relation to a snowball former. <laughs> um, but um,
so, I mean, yes, the relation of cause and effect is a relation. So the idea of cause is a relative idea, and the idea of effect is a relative idea. And therefore, a particular kind of cause or effect is a relative idea. But anyway, getting back to the example of King, right? So in the case of King, it's not like we're warmer, where obviously it's, you know, if you just say something is warmer, I'm going to ask you warmer than what? Right? It's not finished, so to speak, grammatically. If I say so-and-so is a king, you, you know, you might be at least tempted, you know, you, you might not ask king of what? The king of what subjects? You might kind of think king is a kind of person. This would be, that would be a political error. Um, and it's a political error Locke is interested in, I think. And you could tell from the examples he discusses here that he thinks that the, the existence of hidden relatives is, causes potential ethical and political problems. Right? So, I mean, King is, is, is like relatively clear that we talk about King versus subjects, you know, you can't be a king unless there are subjects. Um, although also sometimes, like Hegel calls death the absolute king. I guess meaning it's not king relative to a subject. Or actually he calls it absolute lord. But it's the same issue there, right? Like unlike the master who's only a master relative to a slave or servant, death is an absolute master because it doesn't need the slave to be the master. On the contrary, the slave goes away <laughs> in its mastery, right? Anyway, sorry, that's a little bit of Hegel interpretation there. Um, but right, so I mean, the way we usually use a term like master or king, it, you know, it, it's fairly clear that there's a, there's a correlative that has to be supplied. But, you know, I mean, Locke brings up the examples like concubine, where he says there is no word, right? So there's a word for the correlative of wife, namely husband, but there is no word for the correlative of concubine, he says. And so we start to think of concubine as a type of person rather than as a relation that a person can be into another person. Um, you might think of prostitute as an example like this that goes even farther. He doesn't mention that. <laughs> Maybe he would feel it was indelicate. I don't know. But, um, right, where you start to think that's a type of person. But it's not a type of person. Not an absolute type of person. It's a relative type of person, just as much as king or son or father, or, you know, taller, right? It's, you know, there's someone else. <laughs> That has to be there for someone to be a prostitute. So, um, so at least hopefully you can see from those examples without going into a lot of details why this might be a political or ethical issue. That, we, that, that there are predicates or ideas that are actually relative but that we mistake as absolute. Um, Um, I mean, like those are real problems as opposed to kind of paradoxes that you can get into if you're not careful and the ancient sophists used to do by playing with predicates like, like, or ideas or names, denominations like big. Right, where you can you can get someone to contradict themselves by saying, you know, you say like, well, the big is out. This is easier in Greek, where instead of something big, you say the big. The big is always greater than the small, right? And you're like, yes, of course, the big is always greater than the small. And then you're like, 
Um, and this is a big tree, right? And you're like, oh yeah, that's a really big tree. And then you say, well, how about this mountain? This is kind of a small mountain, isn't it? And you're like, yeah, that's a pretty small mountain. And you're like, but look, this mountain is bigger than this tree. Sometimes the small is greater than the big. <laughs> so that, again, right, it's a paradox that comes, but, but it's, it's not a real social or political problem. It's a paradox that comes from not noting that big is a relative denomination. When you call something big, anytime someone calls something big, you could and maybe in some sense should, I mean, not really should out loud, but in some sense should ask, Big by what standard, right? Big compared to what? A big tree is a tree that's big compared to other trees, right? But it's not, it's, but a big mountain is not a mountain that's big compared to trees. It's a mountain that's big compared to mountains. So just like the same thing can be warmer and colder because it's warmer compared to this and colder compared to that. The same thing can be both big and small because it's big relative to this and small relative to that. Right? All of that is, um, like I said, just along the lines of logical puzzles. I think and that's why I think Locke is less interested in that and more interested in these um, names or ideas where someone has an interest in concealing the relation that's involved. All right, I spent, oh boy, okay, I spent a lot longer talking about that than I meant to. Oh my, I didn't realize it's already so late. Ugh. Okay, I was hoping to catch up today and instead I'm farther behind. But all right, all right, never mind. I'll just press it. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's one thing I want to call, just want to call attention to about relation that I'm going to come back to next week when we talk about identity, which is that given this understanding of relation, a relation has to be between two things. Right? What makes a relation a relation or what makes a relative idea a relative idea is that I don't stay with the first thing but carry my idea outside itself to something else. And, I mean, you know, that's actually the title of um, one of Locke's sections here. Chapter 25, Section 6. The title is Relation um, Always Between Different Things or something always between two things. So this is going to cause a problem when we come to identity, where identity, I can't emphasize this often enough, right? Identity in every traditional or every older context at all just means sameness, right? The Latin word for same is idem. So identity is like idem titi. And the but anyway, right, sameness. So, like, it's not about, so when Locke is going to talk about personal identity, he means what determines, you know, what counts as the same person as someone else. It's not about, like, what group do I identify with? I think that's the way we often use it, something like that. It just means sameness. So anyway, I mean, you know, if you've seen this in a logic course or something, then you're already familiar with what I'm talking about. Identity, that is sameness, appears to be a relation between a thing and itself. Right? I mean, nothing is the same as something else. can never, this relative denomination, identical, can never be applied to something with respect to something else. I mean, never truly applied to something with respect to something else. It's, if it's something else, it's not identical to it. It's not the same. So it appears that identity is a relation that something bears to itself. And yet, um, Locke has explained relation in such a way that there can't be a relation of something to itself. Um, so, 
Well, I mean, so we'll see when you talk about chapter 28, I guess it is, 20, whichever chapter that is, about identity, um, how Locke tries to approach that. You know, he doesn't do what Hegel does and say, sure enough, identity involves something being different from itself and then relating back to itself or something like that. He says, he tries to explain in what sense identity is a relation between two different things, even though it is the relation of sameness. So, uh, like I said, I'll talk about that next week. Um, and the question is, so there's two things that I didn't get to talk about at all. And one is the ideas of substances. They're both super important. Neither of them, let alone both of them, can be discussed in three minutes. Um, okay, so I think I'm just going to say something quick about our ideas of substances according to life. So, um, and then next week when I talk also about Locke's ethics and about personal identity, I'll say something about free will, which is pretty closely associated with those topics. So, um, so the idea of substance in general, the idea of substance in general is, and he's already discussed this before, you know, suppose... I perceive, well, actually, I mean, it, could, it happens even when I perceive just one simple idea, I think. So, like, here in the mind, I'm perceiving this simple idea. So it was caused by a quality, which is a power, to cause me to, see, to perceive this simple idea. But Locke says, we can't conceive of powers existing on their own. We think there must be something that has the power. Right? I mean, and this is somehow related, related to his view that at least um, that a bare power is not a thing. Right? If it's just a power and nothing else, then it's not a thing. It's a power of something. And what is it a power of? It's a power of a substance. So, um, right, so this is the quality slash power. So the idea of substance is the idea of, um, and, you know, when he talk, does talk about freedom of the will, he says exactly this about, he says, freedom is not a property of the will, which is just a power. Freedom is a power of a substance, right? So, I mean, he actually says this himself. It's not just something people say by mistake. However, what he does say about it is that the idea of substance is just whatever has the powers that cause us to perceive things. What is the substance itself? take all those powers away and what's left. Well, obviously, take all those powers away and there's nothing left that we can perceive because you just took away all the powers to get us to perceive something. So Locke says, in a sense, we don't have an idea of substance. It's Sometimes he sounds like he thinks we have no such idea at all, which makes it strange that he then goes on to use it himself. Other times he says something like, it's a confused, relative, obscure idea, not a clear, positive, distinct idea. But in any case, that confused, um, obscure, relative idea is the idea of whatever, the something we know not what, in which the qualities that we actually perceive in here. But there's one important thing I want to say in one minute, which is that's our idea of substance in general. But our ideas of particular types of substances, like gold, how do we form those? Well, it's because 
Um, roughly speaking, I don't know what the style is. There's no doubt. We keep perceiving certain things together, like a yellow color and heaviness, that is like density or high specific gravity, I guess. Um, so um, we keep perceiving those things together. So for each of those things, we suppose a substance in which the quality inheres, the quality of yellowness, the quality of heaviness. And since we find them constantly conjoined, as Hume will say, we suppose that it must be because of this substance that they always come together. So we suppose that this unknown something, we know not what, is such that it can't be yellow and light. Whatever makes it yellow also makes it heavy, and that's why they always come together. And so and this is the last thing I'm going to say. So our ideas, so what's important for our ideas of particular substance, substances is not so much this idea of substan of substanding or supporting, but the idea of necessary coexistence. Necessary coexistence of ideas because of necessary coexistence of powers in the subject. And then if you remember what I said about secondary qualities, you'll understand why Locke thinks that our ideas of particular substances also have something wrong with them. Because in general, if we talk about secondary qualities like yellow and heavy, we don't perceive a necessary connection. We just suppose there is one because we've seen them together so often. Okay, I'm sorry, I've gone three minutes over. Um, uh, so I will see you all on Thursday. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.